Well, I'm going to go back to our text and uh, I'm going to see how far, far we'll get tonight. Genesis chapter 14 and verse number 18. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine, and he was the priest of the Most High God, and he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be the Most High God, which had delivered thine enemies into thy hand, and he gave him tithes of all. And the king of Sodom said unto Abram, Give me the persons, take the goods to thyself. And Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have lift up mine hand unto the Lord, the most high God, the possessor of heaven and earth, that I will take, I will not take from a thread even to a shoe latchet, and that I will not take anything that is thine, lest thou shouldest say, I have made Abram rich and the subject is God's financial plan God bless you and you may be seated in Hebrews chapter 7 of which we we touched on last week Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 11 says this, If therefore perfection were by the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need was there that another priest should arise after the order of Melchizedek and not, after, and not be called after the order of Aaron? And so we are told here that that perfection or the subject of course is is salvation here that the perfect salvation did not come via the levitical priesthood because the levitical priesthood had many different witnesses in there but the perfect salvation however is brought about by the priesthood of jesus christ and that priesthood is not fashioned after the Levitical priesthood, but after Melchizedek. It is this Melchizedek then that Abraham paid tithes to. And if you notice the superiority of the Melchizedekan priesthood, since the writer said that Levi also paid tithes to Melchizedek because he was still in the loins of Abraham, verse 9. And as I may say, as, as I may so say, Levi also, who received tithes, paid tithes in Abraham. So you can see how superior this thing was, or this um, priesthood was, because even Levi, who was to receive tithes, paid tithes to Melchizedek. It is also worthy of note in Galatians chapter 3 and verse 8 that the gospel was preached to Abraham and not the law. And the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all the nations be blessed. And of course, we know that blessing comes through Jesus Christ, who was the promised seed. So the gospel was preached to Abraham and not the law. So you will see then that Abraham has nothing really to do with that law. So then as children of Abraham, we're also obliged or blessed to pay tithes. And if you notice Jesus' remarks in John chapter 8 and verse 39, they answered and said unto him, Abram is our father. And Jesus said unto them, If Abraham was, um, if ye were Abram's children, ye would do the works of Abraham. 
And of course, one of the works of Abraham was paying tithes back then to the legitimate priesthood during his time. And so tonight I'm going to uh, show how tithing is to be systematically carried out. And, and to that end, I'm going to mention five things very quickly. Firstly, we must remember that we tithe to God. When we pay tithes, we pay tithes to God. All tithes belong to God. So to not tithe then is to rob God of what rightfully belongs to him. Let us look in Leviticus chapter 27 and verse 30. Leviticus chapter 27 verse 30. And all the tithes of the land, whether of seed of the land or of the fruit of the tree, is the Lord's. It is holy unto the Lord. Verse 31. And if a man will at all redeem all of his tithes, he shall add there to the fifth part thereof. So there is a penalty if you try to hold back any part of your tithe. And concerning the tithe of the herd or the tithe of the flock, even of the whatsoever passeth under the rod, the tenth shall be holy unto the Lord. So that means you're going to count and every tenth one that pass under the rod, as it were, then that's God's. He shall not search whether it be good or bad. So he's not going to try and, and go through and say this is good or this is bad because God knows a lot of time we as people of God, we will always pick out the bad one and we say that's God. So God just said just, just don't you be, do anything, just count and it, the tenth belongs to me. Neither shall he change it. And if he change it at all, then both it and the change thereof shall be holy. It shall not be redeemed. So he says, if you try and change it and give me another one, then both the, this one and the other one, they're both mine. These are the commandments. And I want you to notice that these are not suggestions. These are the commandments which the Lord commanded Moses for the children of Israel in Mount Sinai. So... All the tithes belong to God, and we dare not change it. If you notice carefully in Malachi chapter 3 and verse 8, so we know it belongs to God. So Malachi asks a question, will a man rob a God? And then God says, yet you have robbed me. So we, we can rob him. And he said, wherein have we robbed you? have robbed me in tithes and in offerings. So we can actually rob God. And so uh, some time ago, Sister, Sister Pointer rightfully uh, pointed out that we can become spiritual felons. If we rob God, become a robber, it's just like robbing the bank. Well, actually, it's, it's worse here because you're robbing your heavenly father which is really not a, not a good thing to do. So tithes then belongs to God, and when we, when we don't pay tithes, that means we are robbing God. And uh, please remember also that tithing is not a product from the law. It did not originate from the law. It did not have its genesis in the law. But tithing, as we read in the text with Abraham, was at least 430 years before the law was given. And it existed even before the time of Abraham because when we see Abraham doing it, it was something that was natural. And so we know then that it existed even before Abraham. What the law did, however was systemized tithing. In other words, when the law came in, it gave a system as how tithing was supposed to be collected, how it was supposed to be used, and who was supposed to receive it. So it gave it a system. And you will see when God does something, there is a, there's an order, there's a system, there is a, there's a pattern. He just doesn't do things haphazardly there is a pattern and so 
when the law came in then, there was then a system given because you're dealing now with a, a large nation. Israel at that time was some two and a half million people. And so tithing, tithes belong to God. To use that which belongs to God to pay our rent, pay our mortgage, pay our car note, buy a pair of shoes, do whatever. To use what belongs to God is to risk getting in trouble with God. And as long as I've been saved, I'm not about to do that. Because when you get in trouble with man, that's one thing. When you get in trouble with God, you can't appeal to anybody else. You can't go to anybody else for refuge. Let us look at uh, Joshua chapter 7 and verse 1. There is an incident right here that we need to pay attention to. But the children of Israel, this is just now when they've gotten over into Canaan. But the children of Israel committed a trespass in their cursed thing. For Achan, the son of Camri, the son of Zabadi, the son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, took up the accursed thing, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against the children of Israel. Drop down to verse 20, if you will. And Achan answered, so Joshua makes inquiry as to who did this thing. God was mad with them. When they went to Ai, they suffered a terrible reverse, and people got killed in that little battle. And so Joshua went through the camp and said, no, somebody messed up. Let's find it. And he went tribe by tribe, house by house, man by man. And then A confessed. confessed. Achan answered Joshua and said, indeed I have sinned against the Lord God of Israel, and thus and thus have I done. When I saw among the spoils a goodly Babylonish garment and 200 shekels of silver, and a wedge of gold of 50 shekels weight, then I, co I coveted them and took them. And behold, they are hid in the earth in the midst of my tent and the silver under it. So Joshua sent messengers and they ran unto the tent and behold, it was hid in his tent and the silver under it. And they took them out of the midst of the tent and brought them unto Joshua and unto all the children of Israel and laid them out before the Lord. And Joshua and all Israel took him, took Achan and the son of Zerah and the silver and the garment and the wedge of gold and his sons and his daughters and his ox and his asses and his sheep and his tent and all that he had. And they brought them unto the valley of Achor. And Joshua said, Why hast thou troubled us? The Lord shall trouble thee this day. And all Israel stoned him with stone and burned them with fire after they had stoned them with stone. That's serious business. Because they had taken what belonged to God. Well, look back to chapter 6. If you bring up chapter 6 verse 19. They had used what was belonging to God. Here's what God told them before that. But of all the silver and gold... And the vessels of brass and of iron are consecrated unto the Lord. They shall come into the treasury of the Lord. So this was a type of first fruit. This was a type of first fruit. And the Lord said, well, you're not supposed to touch it. Anytime we use anything that belongs to God, it will get us in trouble. We may not think that it'll get us into trouble because we have a mindset that God is merciful, God is kind, God is compassionate, God understands it. We have all of that foolishness. But rest assured, if it's written in the Word of God, it's there for a reason. It's not there just for us to look at. It's not just there to fill the pages. It's there for a reason. And so we're always careful to walk where we see others walked and got into trouble. So we don't really want to walk there because then we won't really have an excuse. We won't have an out. So we can't take what belongs to God and then be innocent. So the scripture in Malachi chapter 3 and verse 8 and 9 is right is, is actually if you pull that up for me 
Will a man rob God? Yet ye have robbed me, but you say, Wherein have we robbed thee in tithes and offering? Verse 9. Verse 9. Ye are cursed with a curse. So right in the background of this, of this scripture is the text we read in Joshua. Where you get a curse for using stuff that belongs to God. You're cursed with a curse. And we always want to be careful, beloved. We never want to do that which is against God. And also I mentioned last week in regards to Adam in Eden. God had reserved one tree for himself. He said, the tree that's in the midst of the garden, you shall not eat of it. And we notice the consequence when Adam ate of it. The serpent is cursed, verse 14. The woman has sorrow added to her child, childbearing. Verse 16, the ground is cursed. Verse 17 to 19. And so robbing God is not good. And using what belongs to God is not good. And you, you know, I, I hope, I am hoping that us apostolics are not poor because we're robbing God. Because many times secular Christians are more prosperous than apostolics. And we know that robbing God will draw the curse of God. There's not enough mercy to cover that. Secondly, what does God do with the tithes? If the tithes belong to God and we pay tithes to God, what, what does God do with the tithes? Because God says, if I, if I was hungry, I wouldn't tell you. Cattle up on a thousand hills of mine. Gold is mine. Silver is mine. So God doesn't really need our money. So what does God do with it? In turn then, God gives the tithing to the legitimate priesthood. Whether it is the Levitical priesthood or the Melchizedek, Melchizedek's priesthood. He gives it to the priests. If you pull up Numbers chapter 18 for me, verse 24. But the tithes of the children of Israel, which they shall offer, that, which they offer as a heave offering unto the Lord, I have given to the Levites to inherit. Therefore I have said unto them, among the children of Israel they shall have no inheritance. And so we find then that when Canaan, when, they, when the children of Israel went into Canaan, that whole land was divided up among the tribes. But the tribes of Levi, the tribe of Levi was given no land possession. The only, the, only, the only thing they were given were 48 cities that was scattered throughout the land. And we find then that the, the tithes is given to the Levites. So they were given no land possessions, and that for a good reason, of which we're not going to talk about now. But they were given no land possession, possession but they were given 48 cities throughout the land of Canaan for their dwellings. And also then, in the text, Melchizedek received the tithes. And by extension, the New Testament priesthood also received tithes. If you will go to 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 13 and 14. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 13. Do you not know that they which minister about the holy things live of the things of the temple? And they which wait at the altar are partakers with the altars? He says, even so hath the Lord ordained that they which preach the gospel should live of the gospel. And so there is a system to all of that. God has a system. Thirdly, what is the purpose of tithings? Well, we know that under the, the law, it was given to the Levites, as I made mention, as their means to feed themselves and to feed their family. In the New Testament church, the tithe is given for the work of the ministry. And if we go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 9, let's look at verse 7. Go back up to 
verse 7. Who goeth a warfare at any time at his own charges? And so the apostle now is using pure logic. Um, and, and what he is saying, and, and keep it there because I'm going to go, go further. But what he is saying is if you have an army, uh, those that's in the army don't go to war and have to pay their way to war. Because if that were the case, if, if all of those people in the, in the military service had to pay their way, I don't know they would have one takers there. I mean, it's bad enough when, when, the, when the, the country is paying their way. How about if they had to pay their own way? They're not, they're not about to do that. Uh-uh. So Paul is saying, who got a warfare at any time at his own expense? That's a rhetorical question because the answer is a resounding nobody. Or who plants a vineyard and eat it not of the fruit thereof? Not me. So I'm planting a vineyard or planting anything, planting avocado or cane or whatever. I'm, I'm, I'm getting ready to eat from it as soon as it's ready. I'm not just going to let people come. I, I see, listen, if, if, I, if I'm planting stuff, planting peas and potatoes and all of this, and I see even the screws coming over there, I'm going to ask you now, listen, I'm the one that planted that thing. So just be careful. If you want to stay alive, stay out of there. So anybody's planting a vineyard, he is thinking he is going to get something out of that. Who feedeth a flock and eateth not of the milk of the flock? And of course, everybody will get something out of that. Say these things as a man or say not the law the same also. For it is written in the law of Moses, Thou shalt not muzzle the mouth of the ox that treads out the corn. Doth God take care for oxen? Well, not really. And so in, under the agricultural system, the oxen or the cows used to be the one that actually would, 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 would thresh out the corn. And, and you would not, you would allow the cow then as they're threshing out that, that corn or the wheat, to eat as much as they could eat. So you wouldn't put a muzzle or something like a cap over the mouth so that the oxen couldn't eat because it really, if the, if the cow is working to, 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 to thresh out the corn, it just makes sense that you would feed him. I mean, you wouldn't want that cow, you, you say, well, you know, you, you're doing all that work, but I don't want you to eat because I'm... I want all my corn. Well, no, you can't do that. The cow eventually will die. So if he's threshing out the corn, he's allowed to eat. And, um, and, and go, which verse are you at? I'm going to go all the way to verse 14 very quickly. Uh, verse 10. Verse 11, he says, if, if we have sown unto you spiritual things, is it a great thing if we shall reap your carnal things? He says, well, I'll preach unto you the gospel, and when you tithe, if I'm allowed to eat from that, if I eat from that, that's a reasonable thing. So I'm sowing to you carnal things, I'm sowing to you spiritual things, and then I'm reaping your carnal things. If others be partaker of this power over you are not we rather nevertheless we have not used this power but suffer all things lest we should hinder the gospel of Christ okay so the tithing then goes to the ministry thirdly what is the purpose uh, of tithing I, I, I'm sorry um, the, the, um, the, the work of the ministry then is, is so important that the, the man of God that's there has to give himself, himself wholeheartedly to, or whoever the pastor is, maybe a, a lady pastor, 
that work is going to take so much from him that he is going to have to give himself to the work wholeheartedly. Notice Jesus' remarks in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 24. He was talking, of course, um, on a different setting, but the principle still applies. He says, no man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. So here is a principle then, that if you have divided attention, you will, know, you will do no evil one. If you have your, your, your attention divided, and you're looking to, to do the work of the ministry, and then you're looking to do a secular work, you'll do justice to neither one. And what has happened over the years is that many within the confines of the apostolic faith, and probably elsewhere, I don't know, have attempted to do spiritual work and to do secular work. And initially, when you have a small church, you could probably do that. You could be doing the church work and, and working diligently and then you could work on a job and and work there and 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 do a good job there but of course as the work in the spiritual sense in the church increases then you have to decrease accordingly your secular work because we're not God God can multitask. Sometimes people talk about their multitask, and then usually they're messing one up. So you really cannot do that consistently as the responsibility in the church uh, increases. So what will happen then as the, as the church grows, as your responsibility in the church grows, as your work in the church grows, you simply have to give up the secular one. I've been there, I've done that. And you simply can't do both. It will kill you. Now, if, if, you are, if you're a small church, maybe have 10, 15, 20 people, and you're so inclined to pass the 10, 15 people for 40 years, that's fine. You can do, you can do both. You can do a church and, and, and pastor 12 people. That's not a problem. But you simply can't do that in a large church. And so the tithe then is for the, the ministry. Um, in a small church, of course, uh, initially, this, the tithing then will simply, uh, the ministry there would be simply the pastor. And uh, as the church grows, however, you're going to need full-time people and you're going to need part-time people. At present, for instance, at New Life, we have a small, a small full-time staff of 12 people, and we've got some part-time folk, along with all kinds of volunteers. But as this church grows, that staff will, will have to grow, because you simply can't do the work and, and rely totally on volunteers, because it simply doesn't work like that. Because first of all, volunteers' time is then only limited and and secondly volunteers that volunteer to do some things can unvolunteer at any time and when you unvolunteer then the work won't get done fourthly what is tithe and how should we tithe well we know from our text if you look at uh, verse 20 the Bible said that um, he gave him tithes of all as the latter part of verse 20 and so this is Abram or Abram and Abram is is just before he got his name changed to Abraham so Abram gave tithes of all to Melchizedek and then when we look in Hebrews chapter 7, verses 1 and 2, For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abram, Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth 
part of all. So then we can surmise from that that the tithes is really the tenth part of all. Also, you, you look also, verse 4, it says the same thing. Now consider how great this man was unto whom even the patriarch Abraham gave the tenth of the spoil. So we know then that the tithe is the tenth. And it really means that tithe is 10%, and 10% of all. Gave him tithes of all. So that's 10% of all, not just a part of that. And this is why then we should tithe all of our increase. We should not just tithe a part of it. And this is why we have to tithe on our gross of our salary. We never tithe on the net of the salary, but we tithe on the gross. Because the gross is what is given to us. You say, well, I got to pay this tax, you got to pay it. Well, yeah, that's your obligation. It's a lot of hardship in life, a lot of obligation in life. We all have to pay that. But you, you, your, your increase is the gross. Um, don't know if this microphone keep going on and off here. Turn this one on for me. So we should tithe then on our gross, not our net. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 14 for me, please, and verse 22. Deuteronomy 14, verse 22. Thou shalt truly tithe all the increase of thy seed. And of course, Israel were, were mainly an agricultural nation. So you shall tithe all. Should not try to reserve any part. And then in Genesis chapter 28, verse 22, and this was the the instance where Jacob was leaving Beersheba and heading out to Paden Aaron, where he met that met the Lord, and he had that um, that encounter with God, and he said, "And this stone which I have set for a pillar shall be God's house, and of all that thou shalt give me, I will surely give the tenth unto thee." And you observe again, of all. And that is, that is very important, that all. Of all that you will give me. Jacob really did not want to mess up anything here. He, had, he said, of everything you give me, then I will give you a tenth of that. So that really means for us, it, it, it means not only would you tithe the gross, but if you get any kind of gifts, if somebody gave you a gift, then you should tithe on it. If somebody gave you a bag of grocery, you need to tithe on it. If you get a grant, if you're in school, you need to pay tithe on it. You don't pay tithe on the loan, obviously, because you're going to have to repay that. But the, the grant part of it, you need to pay tithe on it. Everything that we get, God is warning us to tithe. If you notice Jesus is remarks in Matthew chapter 23. If you pull up verse 23 for me. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you pay tithe of mint and anseed and cumin and have omitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith. These ought ye to have done and not to leave the other undone. In other words, you need to do 
the mercy and faith and judgment and so forth. But you're not supposed to neglect tithing. You pull it up maybe in the New Living Text. I think the New Living Text maybe makes it a little, little clearer. What sorrow awaits you teachers of religious law and you Pharisees, hypocrites? For ye are careful to tithe even the tiniest income from your herb gardens. So you, you notice now? Of everything God gave them, even down to the herbs in their gardens. So everything. Cattle, their various increases. But down into the herb. And we would say, well, my goodness, the herb gardens. Well, how are you going to do that? Well, you, you're going to have to get an approximate value. Which is what we need to do. If you get a bag of groceries, get an approximate value of how much that, that is uh, valued, or you may have to look it up if, if it's a shirt or whatever, look it up in a catalog, but get a, get a value of it. Because you want to tithe, you don't want to rob God. So here now, they're tithing in their herb gardens. So God is saying, well, you need to do that, but don't ignore the more important aspects of the law, justice, mercy, and faith. So, so what he's saying there, and we should concur with the Lord, is that from our standpoint, we should be so perfect tithers that it, it's almost second nature to us. It, 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 should be, it should be, well, tithing, man, don't even ask me about that. I, I do that. I do that. That's not a big thing. Justice and mercy, maybe I'm dealing with that a little bit. But tithing, well, that's, I do that. And this is why, of course, that in the New Testament, you don't have that much uh, teaching um, on tithing, although there is enough there, is because in the New Testament then, most of the teaching that you get is because people were struggling in that area. If people were not struggling in that area, there's, there's no reason to talk about it. So the Jews, by and large, they don't struggle with tithing. Apostolics do, but Jews don't. And that's why a lot of them are rich. People that struggle with tithing get a curse from God, and so we're always going to have problems. And the, and, the, and the thing about it is we have this, this precious message that a lot of the secular people don't have but they don't struggle with tithing, so they, God bless them. So a lot of them, they have false doctrine, but they have the money. We have truth, but we don't have any money. Because folks sometimes, well, you know, this week, boy, can't really tithe this week. Oh, Lord, have mercy. Got to pay that mortgage. I got to pay that rent I mean that that's that's that that right there is just outrageous so you, you're not you're not gonna you're not going to do this what I'm gonna do is rob God <laughs> I mean that that really Beloved, you, we, can't, we just simply should not do that. That is not, that is not the way to go about it. We should not leave tithing undone. We should tithe. And then fifthly, who should tithe? Well, the this, this simple answer, of course, is that everybody should tithe. Because there's a principle involved. As we said, that God owned everything and he made us stewards of his, of, his, uh, of his goods. And so we all need to acknowledge God's ownership by tithing on it. When we don't tithe, we're telling God that he doesn't own it, but we own it. And so we, we become liars. And if we're liars, then we're joint with the devil because the devil tells lies. So everyone should tithe. And, and here is the thing also that's attached to, to tithing. There is a blessing that's attached to it. 
So there's an obligation to do it, but there's also a blessing that is attached to it. Even the people then that receive tithing, they should tithe. They need to tithe. So when Melchizedek received tithe, then he should tithe. Levite that received tithe, they need to tithe. Let's look at Numbers chapter 18 and verse 26. So Levites, they received tithe, but they should tithe. Thus, speak unto the Levites and say unto them, When ye take up the children of Israel, the tithes which I have given you from them for your inheritance. So God said, when you get your tithe, I've given the tithe to you. Then ye shall offer up and heave offering of it for the Lord, even a tenth part of the tithe. So the Levite also paid tithes. And as a consequence, therefore, ministers, pastors, those that are in the ministry, they need to pay tithes. And they need to pay tithes, of course, on everything. And I, even my children, I taught them, to pay tithes from their small. If I gave them an allowance, they have to pay tithe on it. If they didn't pay tithe, I didn't give it to them. Because I didn't want them to become robbers. And when they were small, they had to pay it because I paid it for them. <laughs> oh yeah, if they, if they didn't pay, if I found out they didn't pay tithe, they never got that inheritance, boy. They never got that allowance. They got to pay tithes. If you, if you don't teach your children the right thing, they're going to grow up doing the wrong things. And so they need to pay tithes on everything. And everything that they receive, they simply need to tithe. So everybody needs to tithe. You don't make a small enough salary not to tithe. If you make a dollar, you need to put in 10 cents. 10 cents in that, that... Because your name... On that tithe envelope, your name on there, a date on there, is your testimony before God that I've paid my tithes. I, I, I've had people, you know, say, well, you know, I don't really want to put my name on the tithe envelope. They're trying to act spiritual. You know, I don't really want to get recognition and all that. So I just put my tied in just loose, loose chain. Well, no, you don't want to do that. I need to see your, your envelope with your name on there. Because that's your testimony that you've done what God asked you to do. And if you put it in just, just, just cash in there, God will know, but I don't, I won't know. You say, well, what difference does it make if I don't know? Well, a lot. <laughs> and, and so if, suppose you, you, you came to me and said, well, I can't pay my TICO bill this, this month. Could you help me with it? Then the first thing I'm looking, I'm looking at your record of giving. If you don't pay tithes, there's no way under heaven I'm going to give you to somebody else's tithe to pay your bill. And if I don't have a record of it, you can't tell me, well, I put cash in there. How, how will I know you put cash in there? How do I know you're not lying? Uh, I've been in church long enough to know that people in church tell lies. I'm not naive enough. So if your name is not on an envelope and it is not entered into the system, I don't know if you're paying tithes. You might be. But if it's, not, if it's not entered into that system, I'm just assuming you're not paying tithes. And if you're not paying tithes, that means you're robbing God. You're, you're a spiritual felon. And I would not give you any tithe. Furthermore, I wouldn't even give you money out of my pocket because you're a robber. And furthermore, I wouldn't trust you with anything I have because you're a robber.
Look, look now at the blessing that attends tithers. Malachi chapter 3 verse 10. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse. That there may be meat in mine house and no, oh, no observe. And prove me now herewith, said the Lord of hosts. If I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that there shall not be room enough to receive it. God is saying, if you will bring the, all the tithes in, no, don't rob anything. Just, don't, just don't, don't try to cheat or tip God. Just bring all the tithes in. If you made $100 for this week, Put your name in there. Put $10 in there. It's your testimony that you've, te you've, you've done your responsibility and you, 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 you've, uh, you've done what God has asked you. So you made $100 this week. You put $10 in that offering. And you bring all the tithes into the house of God. And the house of God, of course, the storehouse is your local church. So you bring it in and says, God says, prove me now. To, to pay tithes systematically, consistently, effectively is to have faith. If you don't have faith, you're not going to pay tithes. The Bible said without faith, it is impossible to please God. So if you don't have faith, I know you're not going to pay tithes. Because some people say, well, it's going to that preacher. Well, no, it's not. It's your testimony before God that you've done your, what you're supposed to do. And I don't, I don't feel that you people are going to go to heaven if you, don't, if you don't pay tithes. Because do we have robbers in heaven? I don't think so. So if you're a robber of God's tithe, you're not making it into heaven. Um... In 1988, which is sometime before some of you were born, they had a book that came out, 88 Reason Why the Lord Was Coming in 1988. And I believe they said in October, 88. 88 Reason. I had a preacher friend of mine. He said he's never seen as many people paid their back tithes in any other time or setting than in 1988. He said people brought in tithes from, from when Adam was a boy. They brought tithes, everything. They, they, they went home, calculated that thing. They figured God was coming in 1988. They want to get right. Well, why not get right even if God is not coming today? Why not get right? God can come anytime. Because they knew that if you don't pay tithes, you're not going to heaven. Because if you don't pay tithes, you're a robber. So God is giving them a challenge. Bring all the tithes in and watch me if I will not open the window of heaven and pour you out a blessing. And notice how, how, how overflowing this blessing is that you will not have enough room to receive what God will bless you with. How many would really believe that? That God said he will bless you so you won't have enough room to receive it. When you do this thing consistently, not, not just for a weekend. So you, tithing has to become a way of life. You, you can't be looking at it. It just becomes a way of life. And you tithe consistently whatever God bless you with you simply tithe you don't look at it, this or that you simply tithe because it is right and then you will be living in God's overflow you'll be living in God's abundance God will bless you he will open the windows of heaven and you will not have room enough to receive blessings there's many times God blessed me with various things and I bless other people. I don't just use it on myself. I bless other people with that. Verse 11. And notice now, he said he will rebuke the devourer, which would, which would have the devil in view right there. 
He will rebuke the devourer for your sakes, and he shall not destroy your fruits of the ground, neither shall your vine cast her fruit before time in the field, saith the Lord. In other words, when we bring it down to our time, what he is saying, if you tithe, if you're faithful, if you're systematic, if you're consistent tithe and becomes a way of life, your car won't break down as quickly. I mean, eventually it'll break down because it's made by man. If you own a house, your roof won't leak as often. I mean, eventually leak. But God will keep that thing until you have the wherewithals to fix it. So God will, God will protect you. So it's implied here that if they didn't tithe, what God would allow when they, when they had their farm, they had various crops, they have things like pumpkin on the vine. Well, God would allow the enemy to go and just break off all of those youngs. Just break off the pumpkin, break that off. That all the fruit will just fall off. And so that guy that's tithing, that's stealing the tithes, he would go to his orange trees and all, the, all of the, the young orange were on the ground. Never were able to mature. All of this, and God would just cause all of those things, the devour just to go with your stuff and just tear it up. But if we tithe, God said, I'll protect it. If you tithe, I will keep it on the vine so that it'll mature. So many people, usually when people are struggling financially, they're also robbing God. This is what I've proved. And usually if they're robbing God, there are other areas in which they're not faithful either. But tithing is usually a good indicator of their spiritual standing in God. If they don't tithe, they usually have all kinds of problems. When you tithe then, there is a spiritual blessing. Go back to verse 11, uh, verse 12. And he says, and all, did we read verse 11? Did we read verse 11? Okay, verse 12. Go for, and then all nations shall call you blessed. For you shall be a delightsome land, saith the Lord of hosts. Wouldn't it be good? If all of a sudden say, boy, apostolics, they are the most blessed people financially. Boy, I would like to see that. I would like to be able to hear that. Apostolics, my goodness, they are blessed. Look at how God blessed those apostolics. It doesn't matter what, what it was. Oh, God bless them. So, so there is a blessing for us when we tithe. When we do that consistently, God will give us a, a great overflow blessing. He will bless us. And friend... You can say all you want, but I'd prefer, I'd prefer to be blessed than to, cur to be cursed. You can be pious about it, say, no, I, I don't mind if, I'm, if I don't get a lot of blessing. I'm, I'm content with it. Well, no, no, friend, no. Me, I want a lot of blessing. I want blessing that I can have enough room to receive. And if I run out of empty vessel, I'm going to borrow something. I'm going to rent something. I need some blessing. I need excess blessing. I need to live in the overflow. Hmm. And observe now in Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 1. And it shall come to pass, if thou shalt hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to observe and to do all his commandments which I commanded this day, that the Lord thy God will set thee on high above all nations of the earth. And all these blessings shall come on thee and overtake thee if thou shalt hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God. Verse 3, blessed shalt thou be in the city and blessed shalt thou be in the field. Blessed shall be the fruit of your by the body and the fruit of thy ground and the fruit of thy cattle and the increase of thy kind and the flocks of thy sheep. Blessed shall be thy basket and thy store. Blessed shall be thou when comest in. Blessed shall thou be when thou goest out. The Lord shall cause thine enemies that rise up against thee to be smit before thy face. They shall come out against thee one way and shall flee before the seven way. They're going to flee in confusion. Verse 8. The Lord shall come. Now, now observe. 
the Lord shall command the blessing upon thee. And in thy storehouses and in all that thou settest thine hand unto. And he shall bless thee in the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. The Lord shall establish the unholy people unto himself as he had sworn unto thee. If thou shalt keep the commandments of the Lord thy God and walk in his ways. And all the people of the earth shall see thee that thou art called by the name of the Lord. And they shall be afraid of thee. And the Lord shall make thee plenteous in good. Observe. In the fruit of thy body, and in the fruit of thy cattle, and in the fruit of thy ground, in the land which the Lord swear unto thy fathers to give it, the Lord shall open, observe now, he shall open unto thee his good treasure, the heaven to give thee rain unto thy land in his season, and to bless all the work of thine hand, and thou shalt let, now observe, Thou shalt lend unto nations, many nations, and thou shalt not borrow. That means we're not going to be borrowing anything because the, the, the borrower is servant to the lender. God is going to allow us to be lenders, not borrowers. Why? When we do the work of the Lord, when we observe to do his work. Don't rob, but, but be faithful in, in paying our tithes. And he says, and the Lord shall make thee notice the head you know, we've been bringing up the rear long enough. At, at some point, we got to be tired of that. Always at the back. I'm tired of this. I want to be at the head. He said, shall make thee the head and not the tail, and thou shalt be above only, and thou shalt not be beneath. If that thou, if that thou hearken unto the commandments of the Lord thy God, which I command thee this day to observe and to do them. We can stand, I'm done. So God is going to bless us. When we do the, when we tie, because this is a requirement, when we do that, God is going to meet our needs. And every one of us need the blessings of God. So we should not rob God in tithe. But we must systematically pay our tithe. And God will indeed bless us. And God has a great overflowing blessing for us. And we want, I mean, I mean we, we have a lot of work to do. And we need the blessings of God. And we need the blessings of God. And I want you to remember that Abraham was probably one of the richest men in the East. And God will indeed bless us when we do what he's told us that we ought to do. And we ought to tithe. And so, people of God, I, I trust we will, if you're not now currently tithing, that you will make it up in your mind from this time onward. I will always tithe, and I will never rob God, but I will give him what belongs to him. It's his, and we should not rob him.